As the North Atlantic Treaty Organization prepares for a summit meeting in Illinois later this month, the citizens of Chicago are bracing for the onslaught of a police state crackdown against expected protest. This is the Global Research Backgrounder on grtv.ca. Ever since its inception, there have been those who have warned that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, far from offering a simple collective security pact to ensure the integrity of its member nation's borders, would in fact be used as an offensive tool of imperial adventurism and conquest. Since the NATO-led Kosovo bombing campaign of 1999 at the very least, those fears have appeared more and more justified. Since that time, NATO has continued to take a lead role in more and more overtly offensive campaigns of aggression in theater after theater. By now, it is commonly understood to be an extension of the Pentagon itself, a convenient international military instrument for Washington to wield whenever the pretense of an international consensus cannot be achieved at the UN Security Council. NATO's role in the 21st century has so far been defined by its decade-long invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. The decision to invade was made as early as the day after 9-11-2001, when a meeting of the North Atlantic Council determined that, if it is determined that this attack was directed from abroad, the Council would take the unprecedented step of invoking Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, the so-called Collective Defense Clause, which stipulates that an armed attack on any of its member nations would be treated as an attack on all of the nations. The proof that this was an attack directed from abroad, as required by the Council, was supposedly provided by Frank Taylor, a U.S. State Department official who gave a secret presentation that conclusively proved that Al-Qaeda was behind the attacks. Today's was a classified briefing, so I cannot give you all the details. Briefings are also being given directly by the United States to allies and their capitals. The briefing addressed the events of 11th September themselves, the results of the investigation so far, what is known about Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda organization and their involvement in the attacks and in previous terrorist activity and the links between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The facts are clear and compelling. The information presented points conclusively to an Al-Qaeda role in the 11th of September attacks. To this day, the Taylor report upon which the Council made its decision to invoke Article 5 and begin the bombing, invasion, and occupation of Afghanistan for the past 10 years has never been made public. It is still considered to be classified information. Reports continue to emerge on a weekly basis of atrocities committed against civilians in the NATO-led Afghanistan occupation, further inflaming the ire of Afghanis, Pakistanis, and many others throughout the region. But these atrocities, to the extent that they are ever dealt with in the Western media, are inevitably dismissed as examples of lone wolves and bad apples, and quickly discarded from the 24-7 news cycle. NATO forces have also been stationed in Pakistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan over the past decade, and participated in operations as far afield as Macedonia, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Gulf of Aden. NATO also took a lead role in last year's bombardment of civilians in Libya, which so far has resulted in the decimation of that country's infrastructure and led to a system of tribal conflict and partisan strife that leaves the country in a precarious, destabilized position. In all, millions of troops have served under NATO command in countries outside of NATO members' territory. Recently, Admiral James Stavridis, the commander of the U.S. military's European command and NATO's supreme allied commander for Europe, lauded NATO and UCOM as critical entities in the furthering of the Pentagon's goals and objectives. This is an alliance of enormous resources, he said of NATO during an interview with the American Forces Press Service earlier this month and it represents those that stand with us today in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, in the Libya operation, and in the Horn of Africa. So these strategic, enduring partnerships in Europe are going to underpin the strategic focus on the challenges in Asia and in the Middle East. Earlier this week, I talked to Rick Rosoff, director of Stop NATO, about Stavridis' comments and what they reveal about the true nature of NATO. Uh, you know, he, he quite bluntly... Uh, stated that as uh, the Pentagon and Washington as a whole uh, shifted em its emphasis towards it was called the Asian pivot, moving into the Asia Pacific region with um, where the U.S. already has a disproportionate amount of its warships and and general military hardware concentrated, but intensifies uh, you know, the shift in that direction as well as into the Middle East 
that the uh, United States basically counts on, counts on its NATO allies to, um, uh, I don't know how else to put this, uh, assume additional responsibilities, but in essence to police. Uh, Europe, the Mediterranean Sea Basin, which would include not only southern Europe and northern Africa and the, the western part of the Middle East, uh, the South Caucasus and other areas, thereby freeing up uh, the Pentagon to uh, move, for, you know, to points east. Uh, but what in essence is then um, perhaps, uh, you know, not formally announced as such, but a, a division of, of the world uh, between the United States and its major uh, NATO allies in western Europe. So uh, the idea is that, and you know, Stavridis and his colleagues in European Command, in the article you're talking about and a related one, were uh, boasting of the fact that over the past decade, uh, troops in uh, NATO countries have ser served along uh, with those from the United States, and particularly Afghanistan and Iraq, and that that combat interoperability, to use the term NATO is fond of, uh, you know, has to be continued and strengthened. So what that was is really is um, candid an acknowledgement, as I've seen, that uh, w uh, the major purpose of the war in Afghanistan, as I've argued for years, James, you're probably aware, is, uh, you know, has basically been a training ground to uh, break in uh, combat forces from, at the moment, 50 nations, you know, serving under NATO's International Security Assistance Force, and uh, I don't have to tell your listeners how unparalleled and unprecedented this is uh, to have military forces from uh, 50 countries serving under one military command in one comparatively small country. So this is, uh, you know, the emergence of NATO as a um, as a global military expeditionary force, uh, one that is at the beck and call of any of the major NATO nations whenever they choose to. Uh, launch military actions as France and Britain are, you know, arguably in the first instance did against Libya last year. Now the citizens of Chicago, Illinois are bracing for the next NATO summit, a periodic gathering of heads of states of the member countries to discuss policy and set the NATO agenda for the coming years. Perhaps fittingly, Chicago is increasingly being turned into a war zone in preparation for the meeting. In February, it was first revealed that preparations for the summit would include the use of snipers and aerial surveillance, and that Mayor Rahm Emanuel had been given special powers in the lead-up to the summit, including the ability to contract directly for goods or services without the approval of City Council. In April, Chicago's Office of Emergency Management and Communication announced military training exercises including Black Hawk helicopter drills as part of routine training in the city's Loop Business District. Last month, it emerged that the Milwaukee Red Cross was being encouraged to prep for evacuations that might take place as the result of violence or unrest at the summit, and it has since emerged that other locations, including Benedictine University, have been told to prepare evacuation shelters for as many as 1,000 evacuees. Unconstitutional clampdowns on free speech are also underway, with a rally of the National Nurses United group that was scheduled to take place in Daly Plaza days before the summit being shut down by the city which is trying to redirect the march to Grant Park. Recently, I talked to Julio Rauseo, a local Chicago activist, about the preparations for the summit and the protests that are expected to take place. A lot of, a lot of the people are, that, that, I, that I've spoken to are more concerned with what's going to happen in the city. Are we going to see same, the same style events as in Toronto and Pittsburgh and so forth? And a lot of people are concerned with businesses and how, how overall downtown is going to look. Uh, I, I think media-wise, a lot of people don't know really what NATO even is or what NATO's power truly is. So they're just concerned with how pro protesters are, are going to interrupt uh, business as usual. But, you know, friends that I know that are politically involved and are awake know about NATO, know about their war crimes, and are just disgusted that they're even coming to Chicago. Me, personally, I wish they went the same route as the G8 and went to Camp David, much more secure location than coming to Chicago and leaving the floodgates open to uh, destruction in the cities. The NATO summit is due to be held on May 20th and 21st. 
Doubtless on the agenda will be the envisioned drawdown of NATO forces in Afghanistan that is expected to take place in the next two years, as well as opportunities to expand NATO's influence in other parts of the globe, with the implicit aim of countering the growing influence of Beijing and Moscow in the key areas of the Central Asia and the Caucasus. The Brits and Americans are also expected to lecture junior partners of the alliance on the necessity of sharing the burden of future assaults. What will almost certainly not be discussed, however, is the fundamental question of NATO itself. Why this alliance exists decades after the Soviet menace that was the ostensible reason for its creation has been consigned to the dustbin of history, and why it has been more active in recent years than in the entire history of its existence in far-flung parts of the globe and on missions that admittedly have nothing whatsoever to do with the protection of its member states. Instead, it falls yet again to the public to force these issues onto the table. In addition to the usual hurdle of gaining the attention of the world through a controlled establishment media that would not dare to raise these questions about such an institution, however, would-be protesters now face all the weaponry and pain compliance technology of a 21st century police state. As always, those who are interested in finding out more about the summit and its true agenda are encouraged to seek out coverage in the alternative online media and to completely askew the talking heads of the corporate news who will dutifully report NATO press releases as their takeaway from the meeting. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com.